all and then it'll be the least um, disruptive. And then when it's okay. their turn, they can just tell me to move them. If that works, Holly. Great, thanks. Thanks. I'm just going to give folks a couple more minutes to join us here. And then we will call to order. I might switch computers in the meantime. Well, good morning, um, folks. I have, um, I'm having some camera issues. So I'm gonna work on that. Um, but I think, I'm trying to see um, who is here. All right, well, it looks, Although not required, we do have a quorum. So um, I think we'll get started here this morning um, as I try to navigate the camera problem I'm having. <laughs> um, actually, this might be it. No. All right, so um, we will get rolling and I will work on this on the side. Um, good morning, um, the St. Paul City Council uh, policy committee will come to order. Uh, today we have an update on our uh, workforce uh, innovations and other um, other uh, workforce updates. We have along with our esteemed director Ling Becker, we have right track library and PED staff here available to answer our questions. I want to thank uh, Ms. Becker for uh, getting that presentation to us in advance. It was uh, nice to get kind of a heads up of what's in front of us and um, a lot of data, a lot of information. So I'm looking forward to your presentation. And if there are, um, Holly, do you have anything to add before we get started? Uh, good morning, Council President, Council President Brenmoan. I do not. I'm excited for the presentation. Thank you. All right, great. Well, then let's turn things over to Ms. Becker. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you, Council Member uh, President, and also to the Council Members, thank you for having us today. Um, it certainly is not um, just about me and my work today, it's also our whole department, you know, in the county, but also all these city staff that you have um, before you as well. So uh, our intention is actually for me to provide kind of the broad framework of Ramsey County work around workforce and then weave in all the collaboration and intersections that we've been able to um, uh, really um, activate and really are essential as we continue to um, respond to the pandemic and beyond. So um, let me just share my screen here and hopefully you guys all, is that coming through? Is that slide deck up, Holly? Yep, I see it. Okay, let me yes. just make it a little bigger for you. So um, I, I can't see everybody, so I don't know, hopefully if you need to, ask, if you want to ask a question throughout, you know, feel free to, you know, go through the right procedures and maybe let the council president know, um, and then some, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so today, what I hope to talk a little bit about is the impacts of COVID-19, and then a little bit about our CARES um, Act response, um, and then also talk a little bit about resources and tools that we are providing to the community at this time. 
and then um, really delve into the deep partnership conversation. And it really is that it's going to be a conversation um, between you know all of us, including the St. Paul staff and the and the hard work that they've been doing. And then you know just an ending slide on shared opportunities and hearing the council um, the council's direction on where you'd like some of that to to go. Um, you know, I, I know Council Member Tolbert, I want to thank you for your leadership on our workforce board and being that really critical liaison um, for me um, at an elected level. And I know you've seen this slide many times, but really anyone who's met with me um, in the past year continues to see some version of this slide because I feel like it's pretty much a foundational understanding of what we have um, seen during COVID-19. Um, you know, COVID-19 has not affected all people um, equally. And you see that in the way that American Rescue Plan is sort of written. There's a, I, I felt like it really captured a lot of the things that we've been thinking about and it did a really good job calling out that need. Um, really those who are younger, who've had less education and who are black, indigenous and people of color in our community have experienced a extremely disproportionate impact around COVID-19 and the impacts when it comes to employment and certainly around other things like, you know, um, the health, public health issues as well. Um, the way you would read this um, chart is that the orange represents that um, that demographics percentage of our labor force before COVID-19. And the blue represents the percentage of that group's unemployment claims um, as we went through COVID-19. So um, I'll just give the first example, you know, under 34, they represent 35% of our pre-COVID workforce and they were representing 45% of those UI claims. And so where you see that gap between the orange and blue, that is a significant disparity. And you'll see that kind of in the unemployment rates that we'll look at as well. Um, I was able to pull for you the St. Paul unemployment rates from kind of pre-pandemic all the way through, you know, just fairly recently, as most recent as we could get by race and ethnicity. And you'll see like that, that though these widening gaps, right? Kind of during that hike of that height of that pandemic from March to October primarily. But as you see, while, you know, the extremes have gone down, um, that gap has, is wide between especially the American Indian community, the um, black community and the um, two or more races. Those are those three high lines there. Um, comparatively to you know everybody else, but certainly everybody else is still significantly higher than the white population. And what I want to call out is that that width of that gap, right? So we've always had some disparity, even pre-COVID. If you look at January 19 of 2019, there was a disparity, and there always has been in the community. Um, you know that disparity has just gotten. Um, you know, if you note, there's a little closing of the gap as we were moving into COVID. And, and that was that really tight employment market. And, and, and I think there was a little bit of closing of disparities, but what we're seeing now is these, this gap has widened once again um, to pre-pandemic levels and beyond. Um, I wanted to also call out this kind of in unemployment numbers as we, you know, just sometimes it's m more relevant or easier to understand looking at a number than just looking at a graph. So comparing April to April, um, you can see that, you know, the white population, you know, has pretty much, you know, recovered um, a lot of the, the unemployment impacts. And however, we're seeing that, you know, we have significant areas to go um, still for a lot of people of color um, in our community. Um, I wanted to just share about our program participants. These would be people who are actually, you know, enrolled in workforce programs in Ramsey County. And I was able to pull out the city of St. Paul for you from 2018, 2019 to 2020. Over that three year period, we've seen, um, we were seeing a slight reduction in people being served because there was a tight job market. And now those numbers are, um, I wouldn't say they're, in, you know, they're increasing um, to the extent that we would maybe think they were, but I also think a lot of that is due to all the um, supports that are being given right now. And so this is not a, um, maybe as an accurate per, per, perception of exactly where people are at because there are things that are helping them um, maybe not be enrolled in programs um, directly. But we did see that from 2019 to 2020, we were serving you know, a, a, a new 700 St. Paul residents that we weren't serving in the previous year. Um, certainly training and even job search went down significantly during 
the pandemic um, due to you know the public health concerns. We pivoted quickly to um, some virtual services, and certainly we'll talk a lot about that today as we partnered with the library on a variety of things. But um, I will say that you know people were hesitant to do some of those things during the pandemic, and we also have the digital divide, which, you know, when we pivot to more um, digital services, sometimes that doesn't catch those folks. And so we need to, to think about a, that in the future of what a hybrid kind of workforce system starts to look like. Um, I wanted to just give you a quick summary on the $15 million, which was 16% of Ramsey County's CARES funding allocation. Um, we, the yellow here are all the things that served youth and young adults. I felt like that was a really great thing to just sort of point out that we had a variety of programs. We'll talk about some of them as a part of our partnership, certainly the career labs and the tech packs that we did, but we did, um, 89 community contracts, um, working with community-based organizations and that served youth and young adults, but we, you know, served about 2,300 youth and young adults during that really what ended up being a six month time period. I got allocated that money from our county board in late May. Um, we released extremely fast requests for proposals during a very volatile time in the community with the murder of George Floyd and lots of things happening and the civil unrest. And it was just phenomenal, the partnerships that, you know, the community came forth with and really delivered these services on behalf of the city and county. Um, I can't sit, say enough, you know, good things about these organizations and the excellent work that they did. Um, we provided student support kits through our um, Minnesota State Schools. We did internships through our chambers. That's that Future Today project. So just wanted you to kind of see the scope. We also had a resiliency fund where we gave $25,000 um, very similar to probably what you would understand as that small business relief fund that the city and county um, both did, but that was it was targeted to workforce nonprofits as a way to keep them sustainable through the pandemic as we really need them obviously um, today um, to be vibrant in our community. Um, this is just a, a quick snapshot of the youth and young adult organizations that we worked with and contracted with. You're probably familiar with a lot of them and um, you know, and there was more, but these were the youth and young spe young adult specific ones. And I like to show this because it really shows the community effort in helping to kind of uplift youth and young adults during a very critical time. And it demonstrates that, you know, we have amazing community partners, the ecosystem. If you drive up and down University Avenue, there's dozens of workforce organizations, and we should be really um, not only proud of that, but really I find it my role to uplift that work and, and whether it's sometimes it's funding, sometimes it's aligning, other times it's leveraging the work that they do, ensure there's alignment um, amongst the organizations. I think that's really critical. Um, here are some pictures of some of the projects we did. Um, you, you know, you'll see one of the ones with those young men um, up at uh, up at the top, they were all getting interviews and practicing their their mock interviews and I know they got some, you know, haircuts and got, you know, learned how to tie ties. It was really great. We also did some automotive training. Um, and then the bottom one is a, just a Zoom call of um, a project that Junior Achievement did for a cohort of young people. It's a part of our CARES funding as well. Um, I just wanted to show you the demographics of who we served with that $15 million. As you can see, um, it was of high priority to me that we understood the impacts, which is that very first slide that um, I showed you to make sure that we were actually serving those people who've been most COVID impacted because that was the whole premise behind the CARES Act funding. So to be able to reach, you know, 92% BIPOC communities in our in our area and also you know, really e uh, reaching into that 34 and under age group was really critical. And, and that really just is a testament of those partnerships. You know, the county or even maybe the city doesn't have maybe those deep relationships in the community to know where those people are and how to connect with them, but these organizations certainly did. Um, so overall, we served an additional 8,000 people through our CARES Act funding, which is pretty much kind of how many people are generally, you know, give or take 8,000, 10,000 in a given year enrolled in workforce programming in Ramsey County. So we really doubled that, um, what we typically do in, a, in that six month period. Um, there were 5,300 residents that were engaged in some sort of community-based service where they got support from a community organization. Um, in partnership with the library, we'll talk more about tech packs, but we distributed, you know, over 2000 of those and just have tons of feedback on the critical value of those. Um, we delivered over 30, 13,000 services to those folks. 
Um, again, we pivoted to phone and web-based services, so we did field about 4,500 calls. Um, um, and then, you know, in-person career labs, which we'll talk about, you know, served an additional 1,300 residents. And you'll see those are very diverse residents in our community where digital divide is very real. 20% um, found a job while receiving these services. And I would say that that's a good number considering, you know, it was hard to find public, um, safe jobs. And a lot of our people who were impacted, the reason why they couldn't pivot to a job at home is they didn't have the digital skills to be able to do the jobs that maybe even were available and public, you know, um, safe from COVID-19 during that time. Um, I, I, I know this slide is hard to read, but really, this slide kind of speaks for itself. If I can just give you a little context, this is actually occupation gaps in our community. And this was run actually before COVID in late 2019. And I just want to demonstrate that the occupation gaps that we have in our community existed before COVID-19. What COVID-19 has done is accelerated what was already going to happen maybe over the next five years was the prediction but rather now we have to respond with a new urgency. So what you see in the blue are, are where we have too many people working in jobs of fast food, counter workers, cashiers, waiter, waitresses, customer service reps, um, stockers, team assemblers. These all pay 43K or less in our community and they only require high school education or less. Where our businesses and our economy has a shortage as we look into the next five years are the these orange red jobs here and these all jobs pay 70,000 or higher and they require an associate degree or higher so the i think the case for upskilling is um strong it was going to be something i was going to bring to the city council and to our county board for consideration as to how we strategize that and i know the work of the city has already been strategizing that as you think about msb tech hire and some of the other great work that the departments are doing but we need to accelerate this because the change accelerated a lot faster than we were prepared for so that's where that economic competitiveness and inclusion plan comes in right so i hope that you guys can see all the linkages of why it's so important for us to create a strong tax base and be economically competitive is to really you know, have a more inclusive economy that allows people who've been very impacted by COVID-19 to get out of these front end jobs that pay very little and actually, but they can't do that without skills and they can't do it without upskilling. And our, and our businesses are seeing that as well. Um, resources and tools, I just wanted to tell you, we run a robust job board. I can make sure. Um, yeah. Before you move on, um, I see uh, Ms. Nicker had her hand up and Mr. Tolbert as well. So let's sure. just um, yeah, let's do. We'll do a pause at maybe those transitions. I apologize, Council That's Member okay. President. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks yeah. so much, Council President and Ms. Becker. One of the advantages of sending your PowerPoint slides in advance is we know when the uh, transition points are, so we know when to raise <laughs> our hand. So <laughs> I, was, yes. I was timing it appropriately. Um, yeah. This is fascinating information. I really appreciate that you brought up the point about upskilling. I feel like we have talked about this in, with, with your predecessor and in previous mm -hmm. conversations about not just getting into any job, but getting into a, a job that pays a living wage and ideally much more than a living wage and that op offers the opportunity for career advancement. Um, can you, I know you said you were thinking about presenting that to the county and to us. Can you give us just even a, a taste of what that upskilling would look like? Because to me, that that is really the key is is measuring how many folks get into jobs that that pay them a competitive wage where they can stay and where they can advance. Yeah, excellent question, Council Member um, Necker. Um, so, I mean, Council Member and Tober and I just had a conversation about this yesterday, actually. You know, it's really thinking about an investment in people. As a city that's really, you know, you have an office of financial empowerment, right? Like we're trying to put resources into the hands of people. Training and social networks and a lot of the things that people need to be competitive in these jobs, they're not accessible to people who don't have the resources. And so I think it's really, you know, what I hope to bring forth at some point is thinking about a training program that actually allows people to be paid while they are going through training because it's an investment in them, right? We do a lot of investments when it comes to land buildings, capital, things that are physical investments, right? And and yet we have people here who are, you know, true assets to our community. And I think we really do have to pivot trying to think of how we can create learn and earn models where people who traditionally are not able to take time off 
and upskill to really be able to take a pause in their life, kind of isolate some of the other mitigating factors that make it very challenging to enroll in training and how to make that a reality for them. And that's really where I hope to link the county in, in terms of the other holistic supports that people need, like whether it's housing, whether it's mental health services, whether it's social services, whatever, you know, like work impacts everything and everything impacts work. And I think we have to start looking at it from that lens, as well as that individual investment in people and in communities, and then also pairing that with good labor market information and, and where the jobs are in those employer relationships. And I will say our department has not always made that bridge to the employers. I mean, you guys are doing a great job with full stack and we'll be excited to talk about that in a minute, but I'm changing that a lot. Like we are like leveraging in all our chambers and you know, there's some new initiatives next year that I'm really excited about where we're gonna hopefully almost create an employer services partner team out in the community because you know it's it's a way that those chambers can kind of um, lean those businesses into workforce programs and why they need to like support that. So does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting too. Like thinking about the um, the labor unions have done a good job of doing mm -hmm. that kind of on the job training and you know starting out at a, a livable wage and then continuing to go up as you're going through their program so you can do the pro so hopefully we're we're learning from what they've done and how those programs are funded as well mm -hmm. um but i absolutely agree it's like sometimes you're stuck in a, a cycle and you can't go to get more training because you simply can't afford to mm -hmm. um so i appreciate those thoughts uh, mr tolbert yeah my comments are similar to those of um, council member naker and actually um miss becker probably articulated better than i will but i just i think it is important to um recognize the change and, and a really important change of not just placing someone in a job and moving on but giving someone a career that can be self-sustaining and family sustaining um support family supporting wages um i think msp tech hire is probably the most um Ill illustrative of the changes for someone's income that you can see but every industry is like that and some you know, we know we know the industries that need workers that have jobs ready. If 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 a person can get an accreditation, a degree, um, or a certification, depending on the on the types of jobs, we know the major six industries that that need that. And helping people get whether it's a to become a CNA or to become um, a coder or to um, you know become a plumber, those accreditations are what changes someone's life and and quite frankly the um their ability to provide for themselves and their family rather than just a job and i appreciate um laying how you've done such a wonderful job of changing from just a job-based program to a career pathways program i think that's the future i mean one of the things um i think that people in minnesota um and in st paul know is our best assets are people mm -hmm. and historically we haven't invested in everybody in minnesota but we have invested in people and that's why Minnesota can be competitive. We don't have oil like some states, but we have people and that's why we have a high per capita income. The key now is making sure that everybody um, has the opportunity to be invested in, in, in St. Paul. But um, I continue to say our best investment is people and this career pathways push is, is the key um, to the future. So thank you for making that a, a priority. I think it's an important change. Um, also, I know it's going to come back to it, but since we pass it, I do want to um, also recognize, I think it's important, this tech pack idea, which, um, you know, I think, Ling, it came out of your head. I remember when you told me about it and you're like, I want to start this. And I was like, sounds like a great idea. And you went and ran with it and worked with our, with the city on it. And it, it has been a great, it has been a great thing. Um, it has um, helped people have jobs. It has helped people get the tech, some of the tech access that they need. Um, so I just, I think people should recognize what a cool idea it was and it actually is being implemented so um just to recognize that yeah thank you council member um I, i'll have to share the credit actually though with rebecca ryan and katherine pinkert i mean this is the beauty of some of the conversations we're going to talk about today is we were meeting regularly about the challenges in our community um pre-covid right like like we were starting to and you're going to hear this theme of collaboration, linkages, leveraging resources. And, and when there's an emergency like a pandemic, nobody could have foresaw that. We weren't starting from scratch. We've already, we're talking about what were the barriers and we built a trusting relationship to be able to share those ideas. So we were able to activate on them almost shelf, not quite shelf ready, but I mean, 
in some ways it is kind of nice to have those relationships where you have some shelf ready things so that in a case of an emergency or situation where some funding comes your way, you're, you're ready to pivot. And so I appreciate that. Um, I will also mention that um, structures matter in the county. I am in the economic community uh, growth and community investment service team. I am not in the health and wellness service team. And so while I'm very connected to the work of the social services, we at the county have really declared that people are assets just like our land building and capital and our economic development and that linkage between myself and I see, you know, Nicole Goodman and Kristen Gill here. That is absolutely critical so that we're not seen as our people are not, um, I guess, uh, uh, like burdens on our system, but they are the opportunities for our future growth. And, and that's a big mindset. Those that, that That is not the case in any other county in the state. And that is worth, I think, noteworthy. So, um, council member, should I just, is there any more questions or should I go back to the- It looks good. It looks good. I, I think um, just on that last point you made, I, one thing that's always been profound in my mind is that we're the youngest county. Also. Yes, absolutely. and most diverse. <laughs> yeah, so like it, it's, um, we, I feel like we talked about this, um, you know, maybe even five years ago where it's like, let's stop talking about this as a deficit. Let's start talking about it as an asset. I mean, we have a ready workforce. And so I, I really agree. I'm seconding what I'm hearing my colleagues say and what I'm hearing you saying about the, the partners you're working with, that when you shift your mindset and start re recognizing that in a way we're at a huge advantage in our state, mm -hmm. um, that kind of changes the way we play the game. So I, I really appreciate yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. And every workforce program should have an off-ramp to entrepreneurship, in my opinion. And one reason that I kind of got convinced of that is, you know, Mary Rick has introduced me to a ton of entrepreneurs, which is amazing. But to be able to hear from our MFIP young adults who are 24 and under with a couple kids under 10, there are so many of them that are interested in entrepreneurship. And why can't they be, right? I mean, the dreams and aspirations is really the most critical thing that I think we get to tap into. And then our job is to make sure we reduce the barriers and put them on a continuum to be able to reach that. You know, they might not get there on day one, but that that path is available and it's it's a part of our program. So exciting. Um, I, I you know I've really appreciated um, the, those, some of those introductions. Um, all right, so we'll go we'll kind of switch gears just for one minute um, and share a bit about our resources. Um, I can send this to Holly, but if for some reason you haven't checked out our Job Connect page, we rebuilt a new job board recently and it's been so flexible and beneficial. It's got a mapping feature so people can zoom in on a neighborhood, see where there's jobs. We're currently leveraging it in like 10 different ways around a job fair we're doing in the Midway, around a initiative we're doing with Visit St. Paul. So it, it just allows me to do a lot more for employers with that job board. Also on that um, Ramsey County Means Business page is also a training dashboard. I think as of you know yesterday, there was like 60 trainings on there that are free. You can see them um, by industry. They're being offered by community organizations like Goodwill Easter Seals, Hmong American Partnership, you know, all kinds of organizations in our community that people can tap into. And also on there is like a whole listing of all our workforce partners. We're building out career pathway pages for all the school districts. Um, we're currently working with all the Minnesota state system um, schools, Metro, Century and St. Paul College to add content onto the page that they would like to have seen. So it's just really one stop for employers and job seekers to sort of have this intersection. And, and we really built that out because the whole page of Ramsey County Mean, mean Business was driven by our economic development department. But again, it's not just about incentives, land and building. When businesses come and are considering St. Paul and Ramsey County, they want to actually see that we're, we're, we are in the business of upskilling. We are in the business of trying to create a, a talent pool for them. And this is a really important demonstration of that. Um, some of the current employer needs, and I'm sure you've been hearing them, there are major hiring challenges. I've been talking to businesses a lot. Um, we're doing lots of virtual job fairs. I know you've been getting some of that information. Virtual job fairs are not the perfect answer. They don't work for everybody, but they have been pretty productive through the pandemic. Um, we collaborate with some of the other metro area, area counties so that we're not all trying to recreate the wheel because on a virtual world, we don't, you know, we can kind of leverage resources and funnel um, job seekers and employers to one place collectively. But um, at the last construction job fair, I believe there was like 1,200 attendees and, you know, like 37 or 40 companies from throughout the metro. 
Um, we have our first mid uh, midway with our first in-person job fair. Uh, we felt it was very appropriate that it's in the midway. It will be at Allianz Field on the 29th. Um, it's 10 to 2. I would encourage you to stop by. We have lots of employers that are going to be there. There's going to be a mobile vaccine bus that will be there as well. So we're really excited to partner with Allianz and the um, Midway Chamber on that event. Um, you know, in partnership with uh, Mary Rick and some of the work she's been doing, um, we were able to connect with Visit St. Paul. And so we're working on a hospitality initiative right now. Um, I need to update this. I don't think it's going to be July. It's going to be in August. But what you're, I mean, we will appreciate you helping share. But there's going to be a whole campaign around hospitality workers and appreciating them while also sharing about all the jobs that are available in our community in restaurants and um, hotels. And this, they do not have the time to come to a job fair. This was a direct response to what I heard from them and from Hospitality Minnesota that said, we do not want a job fair. We want a place where, you know, we can have everybody go to and see what we have available. And I will say they need tools. They are not used to filling out like job descriptions really in some of these jobs. They kind of post on things like, you know, Craigslist, word of mouth, and this is a new challenge for them. So we're really trying to step up and, and support them through the summer. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention around employer needs is um, our workforce board is going to be launching an inclusive workplaces cohort. And so um, we're going to do this with the Center for Economic Inclusion. We have an application that's going to go live here shortly after the 4th of July. It's been um, vetted and created in partnership with the businesses that are on the workforce board. Um, we are going to serve up to 20 businesses, um, preference given to those who have 100 employees or less. They will all go through a 10 month cohort learning experience and um, end with a capstone project that could mean a policy change in their business, could mean that they're gonna launch a new initiative. But really what we're hearing is that small and mid-sized businesses do not have enough resources to really grapple with how diversity, equity, and inclusion should be implemented and leveraged in their workplace. And as the most diverse county in the state, we want to make sure we have many businesses that are doing this well. So um, this is it's free for the businesses that participate, and um, we will be excited to have the council share that opportunity to um, businesses that you are in contact with in the community. Um, this might be a good time for questions. Let me see what mine. Yeah, is there any questions? I don't see any hands up. All right, um, this will be the fun part. So. Um, so partnerships, I think, you know, absolutely critical. No workforce program in the country is going to be successful without um, leaning into all the partners because limited, you know, resources are scarce um, and there are so many rich resources kind of in the community that just need more alignment. And so I ho I'm hoping I, this is a, a statement that I can make that we have a collaborative vision around economic competitiveness and workforce inclusion. The city might put it slightly different, but I think we all agree with the premise that we want to have a vibrant competitive economy and one tool to do that. And, and one important value to all of us is this workforce inclusion. Um, throughout the partnerships, I'm going to talk kind of about three buckets, really the ongoing city county coordination around each of the partnerships, how strengthening linkages is really, really critical because like I, I said, I think those linkages, if they pre-exist as we like leverage new resources or build new partnerships, like it, it, you just can build on a foundation and that's so critical. And then obviously leveraging resources. We've been able to, you know, ensure that more county dollars are getting aligned with um, projects and partnerships that the count, that the city is very vested in. Um, before I go into the, um, I added this slide, so I know you guys maybe haven't seen it. I, I, I woke up this morning and I thought, oh, this, I really want to make sure I can express this. Um, <laughs> it's really important for you to see the city partnerships that I'm doing, but the why of, of me being a bridge, I think is really critical. So the next slide, I mean, and you've seen the preview, you're going to see the partnerships, right? That where I'm, I'm kind of in a place to support and help, um, in every way I can. But this bridge, this gray box of how I'm a strategic partner within our own county connects your partnerships to all these other areas where I have some voice or table or spot, right? So corrections, county attorney's office, our racial equity and community engagement work we've been doing. 
our financial assistance, early childhood. I've been doing a lot in the workforce space of trying to support early childhood when it comes to um, like leaning into new partnerships with Think Small as we move into um, the next year. Our transforming systems work um, really around, you know, justice involved, like what's like front end reform investments. A residents first work, you know, really that what does a resident, a St. Paul resident experience so when they walk into the door of the county and need services, need workforce services, that connection into social services, making sure that mental health and these other supports are available. And then our public pathway work, which I know you guys are very interested in too, ensuring that we are creating, you know, lots of opportunities for people to work within the city or the county. And so I think this is an important slide because in and of itself, the St. Paul partnerships, I feel are something I get really excited about and I really appreciate. But I hope that, you know, this slide just shows that that important linkage that, you know, while maybe Spark, you know, like for example, Council Member Naker might be you know, connected to workforce, you're also then like more connected to our early childhood work because of that. So that's just an example. So thought I would just kind of outline these partnerships. Um, I showed this to my deputy county manager and she definitely said I've been a busy, busy person. Um, but, you know, I, I hope this is something that shows the depth and breadth of the work that we are doing with the city. And so the top line, um, I will just go through very briefly in one slide. And then the bottom row of partnerships, I'd like to, you know, I have a couple of slides and would like to invite the city um, partners to um, share about the work as well. So um, in terms of the, the top things, obviously, you know, the Workforce Innovation Board is very fundamental to that relationship we have with the city. Thank you, Council Member Tobert and um, Kristen Guild's been our representative from PED. You know, that co-appointing of board members is, is really uh, an important function and something that we shouldn't take lightly. Um, I've been partnering with Muneer and the Office of um, Financial Empowerment. On We meet monthly to make sure that things are in alignment when it comes to the People's Prosperity Pilot, that no one's getting kind of, you know, pushed out of their benefits, that our staff understand the program. Um, we we co-presented to our county board so that they understood the program design and opportunities potentially as we go into the future. So um, East Team, I'm sure you've heard of the East Team, but really around um, attraction, business retention. Um, I know I've interacted with you know Mary and Kristen Guild and Nicole in that work. But one example would be the Medica. I mean, we uh, collaboratively worked with the chamber to um, share um, a good reason why Medica should locate in St. Paul. They ended up picking a location on University Avenue. And, and still to this day, just yesterday, we had a meeting with Medica. We meet with them at least monthly, if not every other week. And they're really one of our best examples of doing targeted hiring. And it's just a great, um, while it's, we've had some like learning on both ends, I would say they feel like it's moving in the right direction in terms of the work they need to do internally. But I mean, they're hiring out of very specific zip codes in Ram in, in St. Paul, if you're not familiar. And I'm kind of making sure that they're getting those applicants and that, you know, whatever gaps they're finding, we're trying to close them so they can actually hire people out of those zip codes um, right around the Midway area. East Team also is a great place to do resource sharing. You know, as a community, we're all, you know, talking about what we're doing um, independently and where, again, that linkages part is, is really important to the work. Um, the continuum of care, you're probably very familiar with the homelessness work that like bridges between the county and city through the continuum of care. I'm actually on the governing board. Um, currently, I'm leading a work group on youth adult homelessness and employment. And it is um, a lot of work, I'll be honest, but it's a it's a, been a missing gap. And I would say workforce in general has been a missing gap in our homeless work. And the county has said, you know, that's no longer going to be the case. And I've taken, taken a much bigger leadership role um, around the continuum of care work in order to leverage more resources as well. Because HUD and DOL, you know, both our funding federal agencies expect that linkage to be strong. And then I just want to thank Council Member Tolbert and Naker for inviting me to be a part of SPARC. I've really learned a lot and it's been a good way for me to understand the workforce development needs of early childhood as well. Um, early childhood in, in the county is not aligned very well at this current time. We're trying to do a better job of that, but um, we needed to, um, you know, think of, think that through quite a bit as to, you know, who to bring to the table. And we're just now adding more county leadership to some of those conversations. 
So I'll take a breath there and take any questions on these kind of quick highlights before we go into the deeper partnership discussions. Um, I don't know if uh, Ms. Becker, if this is getting ahead of you, but I just, um, one, one thing that I think that we could do better and more intentionally, and I think this is as a council and as a county board, yep. is we have many colleges and universities in the city, and we should be sitting on all of their boards. Yeah. Um, I'm on the um, St. Paul College board, but I don't believe that there are spots intentionally for us on other our other colleges mm -hmm. and universities, and we should just... Um, that's something that's like on my to-do list that tends to kind of get bumped to the bottom. But I think just I'm hearing you talk about when you're when you're sitting at the governing board table, um, you not only have a say in the direction that the board is headed, but also you have that information to bring back to our um, elected bodies and to our staff. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm I'm interested in, and maybe we can talk more about it offline. But I, I just think that there's yeah. an opportunity missed there, um, given uh, the number of board members and council members and um, just the intentionality of being con connected to those uh, institutions of higher learning as well. And they all, they run the gamut, you know, it's, yep. you know, um, everything from um, super academic to um, much more technical training focused. And I just, um, that seems to be a place we could grow. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Tolbert also has a, a hand up. I, I think that's a great idea. One of the things, um, just to kind of go off of that, is a few years ago when we were starting the Innovation Cabinet in full stack, we were looking at computer science graduates um, because there was such a shortage. And we, we actually pulled by um, my former legislative aide, called the college's computer science programs and just called and said, how many graduates are you having? And we were um, surprised by how low the numbers were um, St. Paul College um, does a pretty good job of, of, I think, putting students, encouraging students to go on the pathways with, into areas where there are jobs available, where, where there are hiring. I think the one mistake we make by is not pushing our private colleges, um, you know, and, and other colleges to push students into um, careers that, um, that need people. Like computer science and I mean anything in STEM, I suspect at this point, computer science and in other places. But I, I think that's a good point, and it's harder with the private colleges because they kind of can, you know, they can do their own thing. But um, I think it's a good reminder that um, we should probably be more proactive in pushing them for the future of workforce rather than, you know, I suspect like some people on this guy. I mean, I went poli sci, which you know means basically you should probably go to law school. Um, but um, you know, I there there's there's actual career pathways that we probably missed out on, um, and, and we're not doing a good enough job. And that it's not, and that's not a, a critique of the workforce. I just think it is a good reminder that we should be working with the colleges to produce the future workforce we want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and gov and you know, and government workers. You know, like we know that St. Paul Ramsey County um, has state of Minnesota Ramsey County. Um, you know, the you and but other government jobs that typically have, you know, in insurance benefits and, um, you know, other benefits that are good for families and good for security and stabilization. And yet we know that it's not one of the top 10 jobs um, are on the list of top 10 employments that people who live in St. Paul do. So even using that opportunity with the colleges and universities to get people thinking about public service as a career, um, there's so many, you know, such a wide variety of options. Um, Ms. Naker has a hand up as well. Thanks, Council President. Ms. Becker, I just want to commend you for the, the holistic and collaborative approach that, that you are clearly taking as evidenced by this slide and the ones right before it, and I know the ones that are coming up. I just, I, I see on this slide, like the opposite of silos, which we so often see and actually we're often asking about during presentations like this. Well, have you thought about this? How are you connecting with this? Here I see you saying, you know, you're taking a, such a broad approach to workforce, saying that it connects to, to people's prosperity and social services. It connects to business retention and attraction, because if we don't have the businesses here, we can't provide the workforce for them. And similarly, the workforce efforts we are undertaking will help attract more businesses and keep them here. The, the fact that you're linking homelessness and, and employment, and then um, you know, near and dear to my heart, the the way that you've embraced the the work of early childhood education and childcare, 
the spark, the effort formerly known as St. Paul 3K. I mean, I think that just shows how you're seeing workforce in its full totality. And it's just, it's so refreshing. And I think it's going to make us so successful. So I, I just really want to commend you for that. Thank you. Right. Are we ready to move on, Council Member President? I can't see everybody. So yep. I just looks like it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate all the feedback. I'm taking some notes and certainly those education partners are a key priority. And I, you know, we've worked a lot with Minnesota State, but I will agree that the private colleges, we've kind of, you know, maybe not um, brought them to the table as, as much as we should. So that's a good um, call out for the future. Um, okay, so we'll talk a little bit about full stack. Um, first of all, um, Really, you know, my introduction to this is really just that things that you guys already know. Um, there's an urgency for tech jobs. We, you saw that in the upskilling. We have, you know, um, more jobs as we look to the future, and we have a big pool of unemployed workers. And then, how do we kind of center that work on equity, which really means that um, thinking about from a business perspective, how do we ensure they're welcoming places for people to work, that they can be retained once they stay? What are the implications for people who have justice involvement in terms of working in tech? Those are all things that, you know, are things that I think about a lot as we kind of pivot, you know, try to strategize this work. We know there's some misalignments as that, you know, this is going to impact our, 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 our growth in this sector that there's the skills training that's needed, that um, we don't, there's a digital divide, um, you know, obviously that is very big. And I think as a county and city and school district, there will have to be more conversations about how to, through whether it's adult basic ed or through, you know, the count, some of the counties work through the libraries or your, the St. Paul libraries, like how are we all gonna work together to close that gap for people? We know where there are, there's lack of access and um, digital literacy and equipment. And I think that's that beauty of that tech pack model was that we've heard time and time again that you know you can try to solve for one of them, but that actually doesn't solve the problem. People need that, you know, what we've call in, call in the three legs of a stool. Um, you know, we have a lot of assets in Ramsey County. You guys mentioned some of the schools. I mean, we have lots of training programs. We have a lot of community organizations doing the, some of this work. We have new federal stimulus money, obviously, that should be thought about in this area. And also that intersection of all our industries are going to benefit when we do well in tech. And I think um, that is one of the greatest things of you guys having launched Full Stack and some of the conversations around um, MSP Tech Hire, too, is that all jobs are basically tech jobs, in my opinion. It doesn't matter what industry you are, and we are going to be limited in our ability to leverage green jobs or construction jobs, healthcare jobs, you name it if we don't have a strong tech foundation overall. Um, demand's really high. These are good jobs. You know, we just ran this recently with real-time talent, but the wages and the impacts of COVID really haven't affected IT demand um, very substantially. A lot of people, if anything, we all need more IT than we've ever needed, right? So if there's, a, there's a lot of potential here. Um, in terms of the coordination, this is gonna be the framework you see that I'm gonna kind of share with each partnership, but you know, staff connections are huge. You know, I, I see Kosar on here um, who manages MSP Tech Hire. She's been really critical in working directly, not only with our, our staff, but also, you know, um, on our tech committee. Um, she's now part of the WIBS tech committee. So making sure, again, you know, that coordination and linkages is very intertwined, but it, it, it really ensures that that is happening, you know, and then obviously through the East team and then, you know, that cross collaboration. So currently our tech committee chair is Tony Laciba, who also sits on full stack. And, and I think it's just that intersection that we don't want you to work in a silo. We want to make sure we understand what you're doing so that if there's a way that we can, you know, leverage resources or make a better linkage, that that, that just happens so naturally. Um, lots of labor market information. I think more than ever, people have in historically just kind of discounted labor market information. Now we need it more than ever. We need it fast. We need it current. And um, and even, you know, Council Member Tobert uh, called me yesterday and we talked a little bit about, you know, residents and really job seekers and what they're kind of feeling and saying. And we're going to have to tackle that as well. So it's the combination of what businesses are saying, what job seekers are saying. Many people, you know, worked in hospitality and they're saying, I don't want to do that anymore. Well, what is it that they want to do and, and where are they starting from? And those are all really important things. Um, I think the tech areas, they're certainly a great pathway to entrepreneurship. Um, the city is very fortunate to have such a great amount of startup 
um, kind of ecosystem. And I know Mary was a big part of that. And I, I just being able to lean into that as a workforce director and not start from scratch um, and her, for her to be able to see that there's a linkage. It just took us, you know, we aren't starting at like the one yard line. We were already starting at the 50. So it was really, those are really important. And then making sure that we're always leveraging the WIOA dollars for you. And I think um, in the, the city presentation, they'll talk a little bit about that. And again, those other supports, housing, childcare, all those other things, like we can have the best training program we can, but if they people are not being served holistically, they will probably struggle to be successful. So Mary or Kosar, one of you want to take over? Yeah, thank you, Lang. Council President Bren Moen, council members, good morning. Um, I'm going to just have brief remarks on, on just this one slide and then pass to Kosar Mohammed, um, who is our tech hire manager. Um, but, you know, wanted to, wanted to start off with the, the handoff from Ling and, you know, thank Ling for her brilliant partnership and energy. And uh, it's just been incredible, incredible to be able to work with her and, and, and see you in this role. And we collectively have, have been flourishing and it's just been so exciting to be able to do so much more together. Um, so definitely wanted to lead with that and, and also um, you know, been strengthening many of our city relationships and partnerships as well. So, you know, it was, it was a, you know, it was a, I think an important process of even putting this presentation together, um, kind of showing the, the new level of collaboration, you know, between the different partners. Um, but as you, as you can kind of see from this slide, I've, I've, I've listed the, the full stack mission. Um, today, we're just focusing really on the people strategic pillar um, around, uh, you know, so the, the three strategic pillars coming out of the innovation cabinet, people, places, and promotion. But we've really refined our, our mission, you know, to, to be this powerful one around, you know, leveraging tech and innovation to drive sustainable, equitable economic development in St. Paul. And this goal that, that I've put up on this slide, it, you know, and the language was pulled from the three-year report um, Holly actually sent that three-year report following our most recent economic development presentation. So if you want to pull up the whole three-year report for your reference, but this was one of those uh, one of those achievements that I think just highlights the different ways that we're looking at supporting tech talent and people in both attracting jobs, expanding jobs, training our tech workforce, and accelerating leaders. And you know the the leadership bucket is you know definitely connected to a lot of the startup work and ecosystem that, that Ling was referring to. Um, you know, I think important to note, uh, you know, on the, the left side of the slide, you can see a number of the jobs and, and postings that were added, um, which is something to celebrate, but uh, we're, we're, still, we're still very much missing the mark when it does come to all the placements and the placement gaps and the landing of those jobs and a much more recent report from real-time talent uh, showed as, as Ling was, was teeing up in some of these other slides that these gaps are just accelerating in terms of do we have people really trained and qualified to take on these jobs, but the jobs and the need itself has been accelerating and accelerating. And some of that is certainly natural market forces um, but we've been really leaning in as a, as a PED team to say, oh, this is, you know, a company that needs to be connected to full stack or this has a, you know, similar kind of full stack vision. Um, obviously, you know, I, I also fully agree with Ling that so many of our jobs now are tech jobs, right? Like, you, you, you know, whether you're, whether you're working in a, in a warehouse, um, you know, or in healthcare or frankly in hospitality. So, um, there's just such an immense need and opportunity. Um, and, you know, before, before passing to Kosar, who's going to go in, into more detail about MSP Tech Hire and, and what we've been leaning into um, on that front, I also just want to say on our, our, promotion, our promotion strategic pillar for Full Stack, we're excited that we're, we're about to launch a new website in the next one to two weeks. And I say that in part because I, I do strongly believe that communications and communication channels and vehicles are such an important and I think sometimes under under um, appreciated uh, asset and resource in order to get the training opportunities out, in order to get the events out, uh, to build those social networks and to get people you know in front of these opportunities. 
Um, so definitely encourage uh, the council to, to watch for that. Um, we also have a couple new, there's a new Twitter handle. There's a new LinkedIn um, page you can follow. Um, we've, we've, you know, re restarted our e-newsletter and we're going to be doing a press push in July as well with, with some of these start, with some of these stories. So with that, I will pass to Kosar Mohammed to talk about tech hire. And thank you so much, Mary. And before we pass on, I see that council member Naker has her hand up. Did you have a question council member Naker? Um, I, I did Kosar. Thank you with, uh, through the council president. I, um, I'm really glad you just mentioned that, Mary, about the about communication. Um, I noted this tiny box in the bottom left, St. Paul's a great city to source tech talent from an independent observer in 2020, which is an amazing quote. And I, I'm saying this to you because I think you, you and Kosar are our PED reps on the call. I know we talked about this in the economic development update, but given all the conversation we're having about the, the intersectionality of workforce and business ret retention and attraction, it seems like on our city website, on the businesses tab, we should have find employees, right? Or, or hire, hi, I wanna hire. And to have that connection back to the county because for the average business owner opening up, they're not thinking about it as county does workforce, city does full stack and other things and grants. It's, it's one and the same. And so mm -hmm. I could see that quote being a huge banner across the, you know, the job mm -hmm. section of the city website. And I just would encourage you and your team to really think about that communication on all jobs, not just not just full stack. Mm -hmm. Great point. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, Council Member President Brent Mullen and Council Members. My, my name is Kosar Mohammed. I serve as a project manager on the planning and economic development team where I manage full stacks workforce development arm, MSP Tech Hire. So as Mary was explaining the strategic pillar around people, we're really working to develop people through the MSP Tech Hire Scholarship Program. It's really, the primary goal is really to tap into the tap, 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 let, tap into the talent that we have on the sidelines, diversify our IT sector. And through the data that we were able to collect in partnership with folks in Minneapolis, since this is a joint partnership with the city of Minneapolis, we're finding that the region has a limited diversity of race and ethnicity within the IT sector. We find that only 4% of folks that are coming from our Latinx community, 3% of our African American community members, and 1% of our Native American community members are only those folks that are only employed in the industry, right? So there's a significant gap that exists within there. Since 2015, we found that the MSP Tech Hire Program in partnership with Minneapolis has trained over 2,500 students and has employed 1,700 participants who have joined the MSP Tech Hire Program through our scholarships. And those folks have been employed in high wage tech positions. Mary, if you can, or Wayne. For this piece, MSP Tech Hire is able to partner various pieces through accelerated tech training where we work with Software Guild, IT Ready, as well as Prime Digital. They offer training to folks around full stack engineering, UX programming, as well as Java and C Sharp. We also work with our placement support and wraparound career services folks like Ramsey County's Workforce Solutions and Jewish Family Children um, Services. Through the partnership with the city of St. Paul and Minneapolis through MSP Tech Hire, we're able to really focus strategically on supporting folks who are underrepresented communities in tech through these scholarships and being able to recognize who are the folks who are un and underemployed, as well as the communities that we would define as underrepresented in tech. So that's POCI folks, women, and persons with disabilities, right? So our focus and goal is increasing St. Paul's residents' access to equitable tech training and education as, as well as high quality jobs and opportunities. Next slide, please. So what is our impact and strategy that we're focusing on? In 2021, 2021 we we're able to find that we we're able to award over 20 plus scholarships in partnership with Ramsey County's WIOA funding. So with our strategic partnership with Ramsey County, we're able to really provide those holistic supports, right? So an example is some of the participants that we might receive need support if they're needing to quit their job, since a lot of these programs are full time and they're around 15 weeks, averaging 15 to 18 weeks in training. So folks at our Workforce Solutions are able to provide them with access to finding housing support services and rental assistance other social services, as well as tapping in and identifying what childcare needs do they have and how can they address those during the time that they're receiving training. 
So really being able to provide those wraparound services has really been key in finding folks that are really interested in finding higher tech opportunities and um, really being able to provide them with the support that they need during that time. And as I mentioned, in 20, since 2015, we've really been able to strategically line up the amount of students that we have, the participants who are then provided high wage tech opportunities and have found that 50% of those folks are people of color, identify as people of color, and 35% of those folks are women. So providing those folks full scholarships, we found that training those low income folks in St. Paul, we're approaching 100% in women and people of color supported. And with our partnership with Ramsey County, we've really been able to innovatively think of how do we provide those services? How do we tap into the folks in our areas and then really be able to train them into these competitive careers? Question break section. <laughs> Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, um, Ms. Muhammad, thank you. And I, I've pointed this out in past years, wondering not to put you on the spot, but what is the, um, the starting wages for um, people who come out of this program? I think it's, it's pretty, um, pretty impressive. Do you happen to know the ring? Yeah, so that, so council member Tolbert, that data might've changed for 2020 and 2021. But what we've seen in 2019 was that usually we've seen an increase around, I think, most folks were starting off initially where their previous employment was around $10 in an hour or below. And now we're starting to see that most folks are able to get employed on with the starting wage of around $24 an hour after they're done with their training. Though those numbers could have possibly changed during the pandemic. We're still waiting to receive some of that data from our training providers, as well as putting, pulling that data from Workforce One. So and we'll have that data to you as a follow-up as well. Yeah, no, and that's that's exactly what I was getting at because I think it makes the point and it it loops back to what um, Ms. Becker was talking about earlier and a small investment in people uh, is a lifetime of increased wages. And, and this is the one that I think is the most stark, um, but I know it's in, in all industries, but um, thank you. Thank you for that. And I, just to highlight how important these, these scholarships are for um, changing people's life and their own ability. Thank you. All right, are we ready to move on? Yep. Okay, so right track, I know we were just here a, a, not that long ago to talk about our new American Rescue Act um, effort, but just kind of stepping back just a little bit from that, you know, um, just some information for you. One in six people in Ramsey County is under the age of 24. Um, I was on a call with Ruby Lee from Clues a couple weeks ago, 40% of our Latino community is uh, under the age of 24 in our community. So. Um, we are going to have a big change in our community as to who is the who is our workforce. They are our future and they are here today as young adults and youth. Um, they have had significant COVID impacts. Um, they are more likely to have been laid off. They're more likely to have their education have been impacted. Um, this idea of scarring is one of the main reasons why I had a most compelling case for our county board to spend as much money as we did around CARES that while we always wanna see long-term outcomes really for young youth and young adults, when there's a very traumatic um, thing that happens, it's really the scarring factor where, you know, it kind of builds on top of each other as they're kind of having more and more things impact them. So the ability to connect them with a community-based organization, doing something positive, connected to other people, mentors, it's, it's absolutely critical. And any sort of um, detriment to that impacts their future wages, you know, kind of like this investment of people, it almost has the opposite effect when we don't invest in youth and young adults. We actually see then, you know, that the, what results in future years. Um, obviously, we are totally focused on our future workforce, which is this youth and young adults. The highest um, kind of demand careers, really, and this is very broad, but this came from our labor market information, is in these variety of areas. And then we need to kind of figure out how to align this with our industry partnerships, with the right schooling, with the right interests of the young people themselves. And I'm just really grateful for Erica Prosser and Shana Abram for their collaborative work with us. Um, our county city coordination is again, lots of staff connections, regular meetings. And that is why we were able to stand up that Right Track Plus very quickly. Um, it, it, just, it, it just happened naturally because we were already in relationship with each other. I think um, the linkages just ensure 
um, that we are making sure we're serving opportunity youth um, that are involved in county systems, that there's a connection to broader workforce ecosystems, right? It's not necessarily Shana and Erica's job full time to maybe connect with ABE and vocational rehab and you know all the community colleges, but it is my job. And so it is that linkages that we provide. And I think um, we also then bring those employer relationships, both the city economic development department and the county and, and sort of how to leverage that and, and really provide suburban business opportunities to St. Paul residents as well. Again, leveraging resources, we owe a funding as much as possible. Um, I've been just really happy with the way we've been able to, you know, fund EMS Academy, at least around, we're looking to do that again here this fall, being able to provide wraparound services, very critical for youth and young adults. Um, I started a conversation with Erica as to how we could maybe support um, looking more into high school credit exploration for Right Track, the, your traditional program. I've seen it done in, in Minneapolis and I have that person willing to provide some consultation and I'm willing to kind of um, seed some of that to sort of bring that to fruition. And then obviously our American Rescue Plan partnership. So um, Erica and Shana, I don't know which one of you want to start or which one of you are going to share. Um, I think I can start for the slide. Uh, council President and Council Members, thanks for having us here today. Uh, before we get into the rest of Right Track, we thought we would talk about UX Academy real quick, um, as it was a partnership with Ramsey County and with our friends um, from PED. Uh, last fall, COSAR and, uh, was like, hey, let's try this. And um, after a few meetings, we put together a brand new program. Um, so it was uh, 10 weeks of immersive tech training. Uh, there was actually two weeks of pre-training. Um, we did a, a part-time orientation for, for the first two weeks, then 10 weeks of the full-time work. Uh, the young people were paid $400 a week uh, during the 10 weeks. Uh, they were, we were able to purchase them all uh, a MacBook Pro laptop that they were able to keep at the end of the program. So not only did they have the tools they needed during the program, they had um, something they could use with to use afterwards. Um, and they've all been placed and have started internships this week, um, this summer. So we had eight young people who started the program and eight young people who successfully completed the program, which was really, really exciting. Um, it was definitely a collaborative effort uh, between our partners at Prime, MSP Tech IR Ramsey, and, and then our job coach who uh, was there every step of the way during, during the process this spring. So really excited about the results of this. Um, and I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, so we do have some highlights. I don't know that we necessarily have enough time to show the video, but um, I think you all have the slides. So follow the link. It's actually Ethan speaking at last year or at the, the graduation for US, UX Academy um, just last uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's a, it's a quick, bit of his presentation um, on what the Academy meant to him and, and how Right Track has been a part of his life for the last four or five years. This was a little, um, the order was different than I was expecting. So I think Shana, maybe we could, um, this data here, council president and council members, it's nice to be here with you this morning. Um, this slide here um, has data that was included in our 2020 impact report um, that you've already seen. So I think we can I think we can skip over um, I think we can skip over this slide. Um, I'll let Shana um, get into the uh, new initiatives, but I I did want to um, just also express my appreciation for Ling and her team for their incredible partnership. Working collaboratively across bureaucracies can be very difficult. Um, and sometimes I forget that she doesn't work for the city. <laughs> um, the county partnership not only allows us to, has not only allowed us to serve more young people, um, but uh, just as importantly, it's allowed us to deepen the quality of the experiences we offer our youth. So um, thank you, Ling. Um, uh, I also just wanted to say, um, this last year obviously looked a lot different than what we planned for, but I'm really proud of our Right Track team for being able to pivot and find ways to continue to serve our youth by providing them career readiness 
and professional development opportunities in, in new ways. Um, Ling and Mary both talked about the labor market data and how important that is in, in guiding our work. Um, this information has been really helpful to our right track team as well. If we can be strategic in the industries that we're exposing our youth to, then right track plays a really important role in meeting the workforce needs of our region. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Shana now, uh, who can walk us through some of our new initiatives that we've launched in the last year. Um, thanks, Erica. Thanks, everyone, again. Uh, real quickly, last summer, we, we launched a whole new online training program. We've all heard about that already. We won't spend a lot of time talking about that. These are some of the other new things that we've done that I wanted to make sure we highlighted. This school year, we launched a new program with St. Paul Public Schools and placed 40 young people through the Career and Tech Ed program into uh, outside business, uh, local businesses for, for spring internships that they were able to receive school credit for. Um, it was a great partnership. I think it will lead to more. It was also kind of an extension of, we were able to do YJ2 internships in the, the school year this year, which is, um, maybe happened before my time, but definitely is new since since I joined the team. Um, I've already talked about uh, UX Academy a little bit. Um, the restaurant resiliency project that we started last summer, which was an idea of Ling or Mary's, I don't actually know. They both came to us with it and we said yes. Um, we were able to continue that work throughout the school year this year and um, still have young people working with Next on, on similar projects there. Uh, and then... Um, as a result of needing to learn how to communicate in this digital world in a new way, we hired marketing interns. So this year during the school year, we had six of our own YJ2 interns who did all of our marketing materials for us this year. So if you saw any of our videos or social media, um, they also led any virtual events that we held um, and were definitely the face of Right Track this school year, which was great um, because Right Track is a program of young people and for young people. So it was nice to have them leading that work for us. And then in a response to, to COVID, um, we also uh, were able to support a lot of young people having their first time jobs doing food distribution at the various um, rec centers uh, throughout the city, which ended up being a really great way for 14 and 15 year olds to learn how to have a job. So we were happy to be able to support that work in, in, in multiple capacities not on this list of new initiatives, but you're all familiar with because we just presented about it recently is the Youth on Boards initiative, which we're very excited about. Those, um, those interns started their jobs this week. So they're currently learning about uh, what it means to work in the city and um, what it means to, to serve the community. Um, you may be hearing from us in the near future about uh, participating in some of their training or learning opportunities as we move forward. Um, Erica, do you have anything else to add to this slide? Uh, just obviously right, the Right Track Plus uh, program is also a new initiative. <laughs> That's it. All right. And then, um, and then a few more things. Uh, so happening right now, <laughs> uh, the traditional YJ1 and YJ2 programs launched last week with orientation and training and launch days and young people started working yesterday, Monday this week. Uh, we anticipate having about 750 to 800 young people involved in programming this summer um, in either a YJ1, a YJ2 job or the six week uh, professional development series that we started last year. Uh, we're doing that again this year. We had about 150 young people opt into that program before even asking for an internship. Um, I, I think it was, it's a great option for families who weren't sure about safety concerns this summer, so we're happy to provide that. Um, we'll continue to provide the six-week professional development series in the future, um, hopefully on, on smaller scales, but definitely gearing towards those young people who didn't get placed in, in internships the, their first year. Um, a really new, exciting program that it just started in, in earnest this week is uh, the Four Directions Summer Bridge Program. And this is a collaboration with St. Paul Public Schools Indian Education, St. Paul College, um, their Title III programs, the American Indian Family Center, and then McGizzy Communications in um, Minneapolis. 
Uh, the, the young people are all grad, recent graduates of St. Paul Public Schools who um, are interested in enrolling in classes or, or full-time coursework at St. Paul College in the fall. This is a, a, an eight-week summer program. They are doing an internship two days a week, and then the other two days of the week, they spend time um, in St. Paul College's traditional bridge program to prepare students um, to start school. Um, and then in the afternoons, two days a week, they are doing career exploration. So this is a great partnership. Um, we have 12 young people who have signed up for the program and all showed up for work on the first day. Um, and we're really excited um, for this new way to support the, the Native American community and, um, and help uh, build some success. There was, uh, there have been uh, in the past many students who signed up for, enrolled um, to, to college, but didn't actually start in the fall. And so this is our attempt to make sure that they're building their skills and their, their networks um, and uh, earning some money and staying connected to the St. Paul College um, so that they can, can further their education that way. Uh, and then we are continuing to do a, a fair amount of work working with justice affiliated youth um, through the Community First Public Safety Program um, and excited about uh, the number of young people that we've been able to place in positions this summer working with the community ambassadors. And then for our new and expanding partnerships, uh, we are working with St. Paul Public Schools uh, and 3M on the 3M STEP program. So we'll be partnering to help provide job coaching and um, managing the, the payroll aspects and then the training for supervisors for uh, the spring and summer program that St. Paul and 3M have been um, launching or have been working on for a few years. We are also working with the Center for Financial Empowerment Fund um, who works more closely with the Office of Financial Empowerment um, to help more young people or help more youth get uh, or open bank accounts. So we're working closely with Highway Federal Credit Union. So if you're under 18, you can open a non-custodial bank account, which is a great way for a young person to have control and learn about how to manage their funds. Um, we're also increasing our financial empowerment uh, curriculum and opportunities to, to learn uh, about that over the summer. So we're really excited about that. We've already talked about the UX Academy. Um, You've all also heard about the, the forestry pathway with the, the Emerald Ash Bore work in the Port Authority that we're very excited about. And then Ling mentioned already um, the school credit opportunities that we're working, um, working on to, to work with St. Paul Public Schools um, and some other partners to make sure that young people are able to earn credit for, for their time while they're working. Uh, Mr. Tolbert has a hand up, so let's maybe just quick pause. Yeah, I just want to pause on that last page, and um, I, I think it's 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 really um, nice to look at and see the different types of programs and different creative ideas that we've had. I I really appreciate uh, Right Track um, and both Shana and Erica, your willingness to try new things and be creative and and take chances and. There's been a few where we've moved on from them as a city where they didn't work out much, which is great, but we continue to try new things. And I think we should continue to do that. And, 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 um, you know, uh, the, the world obviously has changed a lot in the last year and a half more than it had for a while. But, um, I, I think to continue to be creative and try new things will serve us well, even if not all of them work out, um, at the end of the day, but these are all great things. And, also, a shout out to Ling um, for partnering with Right Track and continuing to partner with Right Track. I think when we started Right Track back in 2013, um, there was also there was kind of a competing county jobs program, youth jobs program, and our program. And we're now working just to help youth, and I think that's really exciting. Um, I I will continue to say I know I've obviously it shouldn't be your top priority this summer as as we're trying to get kids placed and then and job placements, but long term. Now that we're about seven years into this program, I would love to see, you know, where some of those first graduates are at now that they're probably done with college and into their own careers. I, that's that's my selfish interest, but uh, but I think everybody here would would enjoy finding out where are they now because I suspect um, we we've helped set some people on 
sailing into great careers uh, that they're hopefully coming back and helping the next generation of right track employees uh, uh, get into their their business or wherever they're working now. So anyways, thank you guys for your creativity on this. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Tolbert. And I will say that we do have um, a couple interns this summer working on uh, success stories from the past. So I don't know that we'll have hard data from all of the young people um, from 2013, but we are reaching out to folks to, to collect those stories so that we have a better, um, I mean, a more robust story to, to explain what Right Track is and has been to, to the community um, since its beginning. Uh, I believe this is our last slide, which is just really uh, a thank you to all of the partners and folks who have supported Right Track um, for many years. But in particular, this year, uh, we've been able to to do as much as we have from sitting in our homes because of all of all of our partners. So that includes uh, Ling and the the team at Ramsey County, many many employer partners. Um, uh, Three months ago, we had maybe 20 in-person YJ2 jobs, and we have 150 now. So there's been a big increase in the last few months, um, and that's because our employer partners throughout the city and in the area are stepping up. Um, also, many folks in the city departments who have been able to help us, we've talked about PED. I haven't mentioned how much libraries it does to support us on a daily basis and our, our friends at the, the rec centers, but also in OTC and HR. Um, We've created a whole lot of new systems this year to communicate with and collect paperwork and, and manage payroll with, and we couldn't do that without our partners. Um, and then all of our community partners, St. Paul Public Schools, um, you all and, and the mayor's office have been a big support in, in getting the word out about Right Track and, and supporting our work and um, making sure that we have the resources we need to, to do that. And then of course, I can't not mention the Department of Employment and Economic Development um, as a, a major source of funding and, and partnership for us, and then the FR Bigelow Foundation. So just a, a thank you to everyone on this call for your support. Uh, right Track really is a collaboration. Uh, we're a really, really small team, and the reason we get anything done is because of everybody's help. I think you can skip this one, Wayne. Um, I'm gonna go quick so we can get to the libraries. I know Russ couldn't, Russ Stark couldn't join us today, but I just wanted to kind of put a pin in this and certainly we can come back to the city council at any point as we're kind of working this initiative and, and other things through, but really recognizing that there's significant opportunities when it comes to construction and green careers. And we're just starting to understand all those opportunities and trying to figure out how we can leverage them. And so, you know, there have been several tables that have been created now where we're talking about career pathways, we're talking about who the community partners are, what are those certifications that make sense, who, who could provide internships. And so we're just kind of starting this. But I do, you know, I wanted to call it out because it's taken a significant amount of time and we're also, you know, including partnerships with our unions as well. And, I, I, you know, solar jobs, for example, are probably one of the fastest growth jobs that we're seeing in labor market information. And we certainly want to make sure that we have many exits to entrepreneurial pathways. We're leveraging future economic development opportunities like, you know, whatever is happening at, you know, Ford site or Hillcrest, you know, like that connection is just really critical. And also future infrastructure funding, perhaps from the federal government so that we're readying our, our workforce and small businesses to be able to take advantage of whatever might be coming down the pipe. So um, you can read for yourself some of the same kind of coordination linkages um, effort. And we are going to take some of this work and kind of um, collaborate it within the workforce board. And that was at the request of Russ and some of the other partners so that we could maximize um, resources. So, um, yeah, I think so. Maybe we should jump to the library so we make sure we have time for everybody, if that's okay. Um, libraries absolutely play a critical role in everything we've talked about. They are the front center trust community trusted entity when it comes to connecting to resources, lifelong learning, digital access. I can't say enough how critical that relationship is. Um, many of you have heard about that tech pack um, initiative. It was actually called out by the Department of Education as the scalable model that the state should consider 
for digital equity um, efforts in the state. So we're really proud of that in partnership with the city. Um, and then just ongoing communication, you know, like like Catherine and I, Director Pinkert and I meet. I know our staffs are meeting. We're doing some training together. Um, Catherine's also on the governor's workforce board, which really makes sense in terms of like the way we sort of funnel down conversations and resources. And so without further ado, I think we should just make sure we're getting time for them to talk. So Rebecca and Catherine and Zenia, I don't know which one of you are going to share, but here are your slides. Thank you, Ling. Thank you, council yeah. members. Um, I'm Senia Hernandez, the Community Services Coordinator with St. Paul Public Libraries. Um, so I'll start us off with 2020. Um, in 2020, in March, uh, library staff signed, or sorry, in May, library staff signed up to support the Bridge Fund program and answered over 3,000 calls. And library staff are trained to answer questions um, that go beyond just basic answers. They listen, um, they ask for clarifying, um, information um, in a way that gets to what the person is really asking for. They listen for referral possibilities and follow up. Um, so this was a very powerful and difficult experience for staff listening to people's stories and helping virtually. Uh, the experience led many staff to sign up to the Career Labs project when the time came because they understood how many people in the community needed direct support. Um, so it's been powerful to collaborate with Ramsey County Workforce Solutions. Um, we did this through a few ways, through collaborative training sessions regarding workforce services in the county, in the county and elsewhere. Um, staff were able to better understand how the workforce ecosystem works and also understand their role, which is an entry point, as Ling said, and a first point of contact for referrals of all of our partnerships. Um, so we collaborated on the tech pack uh, project um, and distributed 792 tech packs um, through same public libraries, though the number was more. We stood up in-person career lab spaces at four of our library branches, Rondo, Dayton's Bluff, Sunray, and Rice Street. Um, and job seekers had access to computers, Wi-Fi, and to people. At one point, this was the only in-person workforce support in the whole state. So it was a substantial pivot for many of our staff, our spaces, and our duties. Um, and we were able to support over 760 individuals with career lab appointments. And they really reflected the demographics that were most impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so just a few images of one of our career lab spaces at Dayton's Bluff, and you can see some tech packs um, down at the bottom. These were a lot of tech packs um, with a lot of good stuff in them. Um, but just really importantly, this was not an easy or risk-free process for staff. Um, however, our staff were willing to innovate and to provide the necessary community services and to keep each other and community members safe. So at the beginning, staff used laser laser pointers to help people from a distance. And then later on, we were able to secure software that allowed us to help people remotely. But overall, staff created welcoming and safe spaces and assisted the job seekers that were most impacted by COVID-19. So in a regular library context, the number of appointments might seem small, but in a pandemic context, with so many opportunities being closed and a lot of hoops to jump through, this is where, where people came for assistance and we were there for our community when they really needed us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'll, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Next slide. Good morning, Good morning. Council. President and Council members, thank you, Senya. And thank you to Ling and the rest of the Ramsey County Workforce Solutions team. It's been so impactful for us to partner um, and to think about our services differently and integrate them better for our community. These are a couple of um, tech pack quotes that we found impactful, some stories of um, folks who came to our career labs. Um, I went and helped distribute tech pack. This was really the height of the pandemic, November and December, when we were primarily distributing at Dayton's Bluff. And this one woman she came in and I went through the process with her. And then she said, wait a minute, you mean I get to keep this? Um, and she hadn't realized she thought she was signing up to, you know, have it until COVID was over or something like that. And, and then she just turned to me and said, this is my Christmas. Um, and so 
I was, <laughs> I shouldn't have been shocked because that's what we see in the libraries, right? In the, in the sense that all jobs are tech jobs, all tasks are tech tasks, and they're not actually designed to be accessible for folks um, who don't have home connectivity, who don't have a device that's easy to use, and who don't um, necessarily have the digital skills to pivot to use those. Um, so I'm going to transition to talking about 2021. So we are continuing our Career Labs work um, through the Community De Development Black Grant funding. Um, we've had about 760 appointments um, as we open our library doors um, for in-person support. We just know the power of that place in the community that's trusted for people to walk in. And so our numbers have been rising and we have just added a fifth location at Arlington Hills Community Center last week. Um, so we're starting small, but we're really excited. So the things that we've been seeing Career Lab um, users do, job search, write resumes, talk about their job goals, set up Zoom interviews, and in some cases have a quiet space to um, hold that Zoom interview, call unemployment and job coaches, complete new hire paperwork, and then some distance learning and workforce training um, that they aren't able to complete at home, or in some cases they just need some support to, to get through the computer application. Um, so we're really excited to continue, as Ling said, our kind of multifaceted linkages across our organizations. And um, I just want to highlight a couple um, things that the library is continuing to do. The Department of Skill Building, um, we have, as in so many of these things, we've, we've taken hints from our library colleagues across the country, and we have um, piloted a program called Cell Ed, um, which is digital skill building made for mobile phones. So we are meeting our community members where we're at. We um, were provided these funds through our Metro Area Library Consortium, and we are the only library that um, has had kind of a shovel ready relationships for cell ed. So currently we have 77 learners skill building on mobile. They're quick five minute lessons that you can do on your phone. It's GED, computer citizenship, English language learning. Um, I believe cell ed is rolling out a medical career pathway. And I wanna say that um, these 77 learners um, we have piloted this with um, our Spanish speaking um, community specialists. So we this is this is targeted. <laughs> we keep reaching out to our um, fellow Melsa libraries and they keep turning our licenses over to us, I think, uh, because we um, haven't haven't met the need um, for this kind of um, quick mobile meet people where they're at like open the door, um, very entry level skill building, but that has been really impactful for community members. Um, and then the next thing that we're doing is we got some funding from the Library Services and Technology Act to stand up some specific digital navigators in the library. Um, we saw the power of the digital navigators in the Tech Pack project. And so what these um, navigators will do is work one-on-one -on -one with people to address their home connectivity needs, their device needs, and then hopefully whatever personal goals they have in terms of um, skill building. So um, this is a, a national model at this point that we're really excited to try out here in St. Paul that we think will have connections going forward with a number of um, digital inclusion and equity activities that um, we're going to continue to lean into. Um, and so we're excited for where the rest of 2021 will take us as we've reached our full open hours and every week we see we see more people and we see more people in in the career lab so we're really excited to continue the partnership and to have the support um, of the county and of our um, fellow city departments. Great. Um, maybe I'll end here, end with this, and then we can take any last questions. I know we're running near the end of time, Councilmember President. But you know, basically, I think you guys have seen it. You know, we have a lot of shared opportunities that um, I don't see them as challenges. I definitely see them as opportunities. Hopefully, we were able to put that lens through to you today. Um, you know, developing kind of a strategic workforce plan. You know, of set of initiatives that you know intersect all these areas that you know the county it plays a critical role in. Um, is something, you know, I would be in support of. Um, digital and tech equity is something that is uh, very real in our community and will hold us back. 
if we don't continue to learn and think about how to leverage that. Um, I was on a call with Comcast last week and they, they have resources I didn't even know about either. And so I, I think, you know, that that conversation that I continue to have with um, Rebecca and, and Director Pinkert, I mean, it's going to be critical because we need to get grab those resources and make sure that we're putting them out in the community. So um, I learned about these lift zones that if any place that's not a government building that provides workforce services cannot get internet connectivity at a higher rate. And I mean, these things that, you know, we didn't know about and now, you know, I need to figure out how to execute those um, on behalf of the city and county. Uh, more holistic approach. I mean, you know that, you know, even pre-pandemic, you know, lots of things were holding back our residents and those barriers still exist today and they did not get better due to COVID, they got worse. And so this intersection of housing and the other workforce supports and what we're really talking about is family and individual stability in order to be successful at education and training. Um, entrepreneurship tied to workforce development and then that upskilling, investment in people, acceleration toward the future of work, leveraging, you know, whether it's ARP or other sources of funding, I, I, I think the opportunity is um, is here for us. And if we can, you know, work collaboratively together, I, I truly believe we could have different outcomes in this community. So um, I'll end with that and take any questions or I'm sure everybody else would take questions too. So <laughs> let, me, let me see how to not share here, sorry. All right, that was a very long, thank you for your little extension of time. No, we we look forward to this presentation and I think we've been getting, you know, bits and pieces throughout the course of um, COVID and with other check-ins like Right Track mm -hmm. Plus. And so just to hear it all together, I, it's overwhelming in the best way. I mean, this is just fantastic. I I've ha keep having these visions of you and this team of collaborators kind of getting in the V formation mm -hmm. and walking down the road, making your video like slow-mo because you're just <laughs> Knocking it out of the park. Here Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I would like to be um, there to help film that. Um, I see Mr. Tolbert has a hand up. I can't believe you said V form formation and then go to Mighty Ducks because that's what initially I thought. I thought you were <laughs> that analogy, but um, I, I want to just say um, first of all, take a moment um, to to echo what Council President Brenmon said, and I think this is a it was really nice to see all this workforce stuff in one um, big swoop. And I, it should also be recognized that this isn't everything either. Um, everything goes back to workforce and there's more going on. This is just a highlight of some of the big things. Um, but, and I know I've, we've all said this multiple times and I'll continue to say it, um, but the partnership between Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul, particularly when you became director um, as Becker has been fantastic and it only continues to get better. And, and, I can tell you, I'm really grateful for that. Um, it is something that I think over the years was very frustrating to see the lack of um, partnership. And I think just the, you can just see the um, um, collaboration just on how people interact on this Zoom call with each other um, to show how um, collaborative it is and, and it's fantastic. So thank you, um, but also thank you to the city staff from, mm -hmm. from Polsec to libraries to Right Track um, mm -hmm. for continuing to push um, um, St. Paul forward and into the future and investing in people. So um, really grateful for that. And I continue to watch, I suspect next year will be even more exciting as, as this presentation comes forward. Um, and lastly, um, Ms. Becker, thank you for getting us the presentation ahead of time. Um, we, we ask for it often and don't usually get it, but we appreciate that you got it to the council ahead of time. That's, it's useful to be able to read it and let it absorb. So thank you. Great, second on that. Um, other thoughts or comments um, at this time? Seeing lots of thumbs up, lots of support here. And I, I as we're, um, I know that the administration and the city is working on its side of the you know, budget proposal right now, then the work of the council begins on the, its um, uh, calling through the budget and making our recommendations. So the timing of this conversation is perfect for us, um, acknowledging or to understand um, what you're, uh, where you're advancing, where you have needs, um, where we can collaborate and where we can throw our support. So thank you for that. Um, and I expect that we will continue to be in conversation with you in the months to come. And again, as I appreciate what Mr. Tolbert just said, like a year from now when we have data to back up um, even more, what we know is happening, I think that's gonna be fantastic. And I really do like the idea um, of 
of trying to reconnect with some folks that we've invested in um, post-graduation and post-employment and just um, getting some of those stories um, to share as well. So, um, but again, so much here. Um, I'm so impressed with this uh, collaborative uh, group of women. Um, and like I said, if we want to go do that, the I'm in, I will film it. Um, <laughs> sounds like fun to me. So, okay, it does, there doesn't look like there's other questions at this time. Um, but as I said, we will be in touch um, as we go with collaborative yeah. the rest of this year. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll just end by saying, you know, I, I do hope the staff and the council um, realizes I am also the city's workforce director. I'm here to help you have those linkages, you know, that 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 is a role that I, I take seriously and I, I see it as my role. So um, I appreciate staff for, you know, leaning in where, where they need help and, and alignment and it's been great. So thank you. That's, that's a refreshing take. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right. Before we adjourn, Holly, is there anything you um, would like to add about upcoming uh, conversations or uh, our Oregon policy committees in the weeks to come or budget update? Uh, Council President Bren Moan, Council Members. Um, next week is a fifth Wednesday, so there's no meeting. And then on July 7th, we will have um, an organizational meeting at 10 a.m. And um, I'm forgetting the first topic, um, but there's a short topic. And then uh, PED is joining us for planning uh, strategy update. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. Um, council meets again today at 2 and again at 3.30. So we'll see folks later. And again, thank you to our presenters and collaborators here today. We're so impressed. Thank All you. right. We are adjourned.